find that really hard, um, learning how to try and raise awareness with people maybe that aren't just quite ready. It's really easy to uh, reach out to the people that are already converted, that already have that kind of awareness, but how do we engage more people in critical thinking? Um, and I went to this great workshop, actually put on by a professor from the UK who does a lot of um, group organizing around social movements, and he said, you know, we rarely ask the question why. He said, we're, when we're involved in community organizing or, or you know, um, embarking on a, wanting to make a change, we often think about the what, when, the where, who, but we rarely take the time to ask the question why. And the why question is really the fundamental question because it's what gives us the energy to want to achieve our goals, to want to understand what's going on. And, and it actually gives us the permission to question why are things organized in this way? Why are we degrading the environment faster than we can repair it? Why do we let capitalism, you know, why is it so unfettered? So I think the question, some of the things I've learned in these last two years is also the movements that I'm seeing, whether it's Idle No More or Occupy or even internet campaigns, is I think people are starting to ask those questions why, and I think that that can really be a driving force to, um, to keeping the momentum. The formation that I've done is on the history, the history of the autochtone, the story, the one that I didn't know, the one that I didn't live. L'histoire autochtone euh, m'a bouleversée. Quand que je dis renverser les tables, ça me renversé. Quand j'ai vu toutes les oppressions qu'on a fait vivre à mon peuple à cause de la loi sur les Indiens, à cause de ce qui se passait réellement, je peux vous dire que je me suis levée de bout. Et depuis ce temps-là, je suis de bout. Depuis ce temps-là, je suis fière de ce que je suis. Et euh, je suis une grande enseignante. J'enseigne énormément l'histoire parce que je me dis, je pense qu'il y a peu de gens qui nous connaissent vraiment. Je pense qu'il y a peu de gens qui connaissent pourquoi qu'on vit ces difficultés dans nos communautés. Euh, je, vous, je vais vous conter une petite anecdote. Quand je vais à l'université encore, des fois, quand on m'invite, puis je suis très honorée d'y aller, euh, sur 70 élèves, euh, je leur demande euh, première question. Euh, Savez-vous pourquoi les Autochtones vivent dans les réserves? Puis quand il n'y en a pas un qui lève sa main, là, bien, c'est là que je commence l'histoire. Je pense qu'il faut comprendre pourquoi qu'on vit dans les réserves. Pourquoi qu'on n'a pas de terre? Pourquoi qu'on ne peut pas se développer économiquement? Pourquoi on est si pauvre dans nos communautés? C'est la cause de l'histoire. C'est à cause de ce qui se passe. Que, que moi, je, 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 vraiment, si moi, mon histoire, je l'ai appris, puis ça m'a libéré de mes oppressions, je me dis, bien, en tant que non-autochtone aussi, on peut se libérer ensemble. Parce que je peux vous dire toujours qu'on a besoin de vous autres. On a besoin des uns et des autres. Parce que toute seule, on ne réussira pas à faire, puis à naître de nouveau comme peuple. On a vraiment besoin de, de vous autres. My second challenge was how to overcome this, this feeling of powerlessness. So where did we want to focus our attention? Because in the community, in the wider community, in the world, there are so many needs, so many challenges. And we, took, we found this book, and it was called Making a Change, and it was by a young man called Bilal Rajan. And many of you might be familiar with his story. And this story was, you know, it was very simple, but it gave concrete ideas on small things you could do to make a difference. And that those small acts were just as powerful as the big ones. So we started to discover and research both local organizations and those uh, in the wider community and beyond. And we explored each of our strengths and weaknesses as individuals, but also as a group, what we could do and the amazing and awesome things we could, we could aspire to uh, together. So we, at the same time, we reached out to other youth leaders in both faith-based and secular, and we started creating gathering spaces for both fun events, but community outreach, and, and making a change in our smaller community. We started supporting local food bank programs, taking the opportunities to serve on Dans la Rue. It's a, a van that provides food to homeless youth and young adults in Montreal. And they started to realize that empowered, they could make a difference. So Sunday mornings, we, we started to discuss more, and it allowed us to explore 
issues on a more global scale. And one of the areas we decided to focus on was invisible children movement. And that allowed us to raise awareness, raise funds as well, but to let people know what was happening with the child soldiers in Uganda. Thank you. Oh, you're so good. <laughs> So we researched and we invited the Invisible uh, Children team to come in and speak to our group, let us know what was happening, how we could help, and we then in turn invited the wider community, our congregation, and other youth groups to join us, raising awareness. Our team started to arrange community, t uh, community nights. They went and spoke in local schools and, and other youth groups, elementary schools and high schools, and they started creating these learning circles in their communities. It was really awesome. Parallel to this, many of the churches in our area, and particularly in our denomination, were really struggling with having youth and young adults engage in the life of the church. Leaders were isolated. Most of them, like me, are volunteers. So, you know, resources were scarce. So we, we saw the parallel of both these groups, and we started creating a network of youth, young adults, and leaders to support, to educate, and to empower people to make a difference in their communities. And our Yaya network now includes both what I call churchgoers and those that are not directly associated with any of our institutions. It's pretty awesome. Et moi, je pense qu'il y a un avenir comme, euh, comme Église dans la mesure où on se ressente sur le fondamental qui est Jésus-Christ comme libérateur. La théologie de la libération a ouvert un chemin formidable exact. Allons voir le 4, c'est la libération de toutes les oppressions. Et maintenant que la chrétienté est sur son déclin, on va pouvoir recréer à partir de l'intuition fondamentale. Fait que là, il faut démembrer un peu des structures pour retourner à l'essentiel, continuer à mettre l'accent sur la, forma la formation, parce que c'est compliqué de traduire en, en action d'aujourd'hui un évangile qui a été écrit au premier siècle de notre ère. Hein? Fait il, y a, il y a tout un travail de réflexion. Euh, en tout cas, moi, ma, après être passé par euh, l'évangile, le marxisme, euh, l'incroyance, le retour à l'évangile, euh, c'est ce qui nourrit beaucoup euh, l'engagement euh, à partir de l'Église euh, sur le terrain.